Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Hi. Good to hear you talking back a little bit. Um, okay, yep. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about psychology and how we apply that to user experience design. And I'm going to be talking about two theories from psychology, designing for the fast way we think and designing for the slow way that we, th that we think. So, hands up. Um, hands up if you've ever booked a hotel online. Hands up. Yes, very good. Hands up if you've ever bought something from a famous international auction site of four letters. Yeah. Hands up if you've ever booked a train ticket online in the UK. A few of you. All right. So you've all used something that I've designed over the last 12 years of working in um, digital design. Um, so my background is psychology. I use psychology to apply and to design large-scale stuff for large-scale businesses, typically the stuff that's really complicated. And a few years ago, I wrote a book. Um, anybody read the book? Yeah, anybody bought the book? A lot of people buy it because it's only three quid, but nobody reads it. You should do. It's called Psychology for Designers, and it basically does what it says on the cover. So it's a great guide if you're a designer or you work in digital product, product design and you want some help from psychology. So in my job, I do three things. Pretty much a third of my time spent researching, so going out, speaking to consumers, and watching them use digital stuff. And again, back to Peter Petter's earlier stuff, I always watch people using digital stuff rather than asking them what they want. I spend a third of my time then formulating that to help businesses make a decision about what they should do. Again, if you're working digital businesses, you know what it's like. You all know what you've got to do. Half the battle is convincing everybody else that you've got to do it. Now, I spend a third of my time then getting my, rolling my sleeves up and doing actual digital design. And throughout my career, um, user experience, I've applied psychology to a lot of the design process and designs that I've worked on. And there was one book which was published in 2009 by a, a gentleman called Daniel Kahneman. And fantastic book. It talks about two systems in the human brain, one of which allows us to make decisions immediately, quickly, based on emotion, around survival and getting stuff done quickly. It talks about another system which makes decisions slowly. Previous experience allows us to understand and predict what's going to happen, and we think about what we're going to do. And so I'm going to talk, spend the next 11 minutes or so talking about the two ways of thinking, thinking fast and thinking slow, and how to design for both sets of systems. Now, I'm going to do this in 11 minutes. If you're coming to my masterclass, I'm doing a masterclass on Thursday. I'm spending four hours doing this, so I'm going to try and be as quick as I can and do it in 11 minutes. But if you come to my masterclass on Thursday, I'll go into this in a lot more depth. So let's talk about the slow. As I said, I studied neuroscience and psychology. My mum was a psychologist. My dad was an architect. I've got design and psychology. I've had that throughout my life. And certain events have happened to me in my life that have made me think, well, how is psychology and design coming together at this particular point? Uh, anybody been here? Anybody near this city? Buenos Aires in Argentina, yes. I've been to Buenos Aires twice, and the same thing happened to me t both times in Argentina. I went to an ATM machine, put my card in, took my money, machine ate my card. Like five minutes later, I was like, oh, where's my cash card? Bank had eaten my card. That was back in 2006. Went back in 2009. This is the first machine that ate my card. Took a photo of it for, for the bank, just in case they wanted to see it. This is the second time I went back to Argentina. And my card got eaten the second time I went back to Argentina. And it got me thinking. It got me thinking, well, what's wrong with me? Why on earth was my, card, my cash card eaten twice by the ATM machine in Argentina? And I searched the internet, and sure enough, Hundreds and hundreds of British, European, and American travelers had been to Argentina, and they'd had their ATM cards eaten. And it wasn't a technical problem, it was a human problem. And that's certainly what the banks said to me when I tried to get my cash card back, and they charged me both times. They said, you failed to pick your card up. It was your fault, not the bank's fault. And that got me thinking, so how can psychology help us understand what's going on when it comes to using an ATM? Here's me using an ATM. This is the second time I took this video. The first one, I actually showed myself typing my PIN number, which obviously is not a very good thing to do at a conference. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not all that stupid. So I thought, well, how can psychology help me understand what happened when I was using this ATM and why ATMs in Argentina in particular eat everybody's ATM cards? 
So this is the process I go through in the UK. First thing I do, enter my card, I enter my PIN number, I select the amount of money that I want, I remove the card, I get my cash. Now there's this important thing in psychology called goal state. Goal state is when you've made a decision, yeah, you get the thing that you want at the end of it. You go through a process, you hit goal state. In case of using an ATM, your goal state is to get cash money out of the ATM machine. I mean, not rocket science, this is what's called the goal state. So I thought, well, this is how we use it in the UK, pretty much similar to the way it's used here in Europe. How and what went wrong in Argentina? So here's the process of using a cash machine in Argentina. Enter card, enter your PIN, so far so good. Select the amount of money that you want, then what happens? You get your cash. What step is missing here? You're looking for the step, what step's missing? You remove your card after you get your cash. So what's going wrong when us Europeans and Americans are using ATM machines in, the, in Argentina is the goal state is achieved before the end of the process. So everybody's like, right, I've got my cash, I'm finished, I'm done. You walk out of the bank, you leave your ATM card, and it gets stolen, it gets eaten by the cash machine that's there. This is what we call a user journey or a mental model of the steps that people go through when they're using a particular service. And the way that we work as humans, we build mental models of how the world works around us. We spend all our time understanding how the world works, and we take these mental models of how the world works, and we apply them to new and novel situations. So all of our past experience helps us make decisions and choices for the future. But when something goes wrong, it causes us real problems. So when something goes wrong through these processes that we've worked, this slow process of building up the experience of how something works, when something goes wrong, it's a real problem for us. Here's cash machines around the world. I mean, the order's different, but the goal state is at the end is the same way around. It doesn't matter if you're using a cash machine in Japan or the USA, you're still going to hit the goal state at the end and it doesn't matter too much. It might be a bit, you might be a bit unsure what's going on, but you're not going to make the same mistake that you used in Argentina. So how does this apply to digital design? How can we better use this to design our apps, our websites, to better fit human needs? So I want to talk about cruising. Uh, and specifically, a project I worked on a few years ago for cruising for the over 60s in the UK, so for older people in the UK. Now, booking a cruise is a really complicated thing. There are hundreds of decisions to make. We went through and we worked out there's about 234 decisions that people have got to make when they're booking a typical vacation or holiday, especially on a cruise liner. 234 decisions. And supporting people through that many decisions is incredibly difficult. And here is what the cruise company I worked for, this was their idea of how people booked cruises online. You know, really simple. This is what you do. You choose what type of cruise you want, you choose what type of sit, ship, you choose the itinerary, the detail, the cabin, the flight, and then the passenger details. This is the order that they expected things to happen in. So we did some pretty basic research. We went out and we spoke to 10 people about how they book cruise holidays online. Now, I know what you're thinking now. And yes, the gentleman there is wearing a wig. And it was the most difficult used research session I've ever worked in. This isn't the actual picture of him. It was quite hard for me to find somebody with a wig. These aren't the real people I spoke to. But I spent an hour speaking to people and watching them use the website to book a cruise. Pretty simple stuff. And we just discussed how they did it. Okay? I watched them do it step by step by step. They kept a diary of how they booked it over the six months that they were booking and deciding on a cruise. We spent a bit of time talking to them. Incredible piece of research to understand how people make decisions based on the information they've already got. We also spent an awful lot of time in the customer call center, listening to calls of people phoning up and saying, how do I book a cruise online? And more importantly, how the people on the other end of the telephone helped them make a decision. How the people on the telephone selling the cruise holidays helped people make a choice. Should you choose cabin 432 or cabin 431? On the cruise holiday itself, you could choose exactly the cabin that you wanted on a ship. There are 2,000 cabins on most cruise liners. How do you choose exactly the cabin that you want? On the phone, these guys just chose the cabin for you. But online, you could have the whole view of the ship and you could choose a cabin. Choice. As Renata said, the tyranny of choice. 2,000 cabins. It's impossible to make that choice. I also spent a week on an over 60s cruise. I've got some incredible stories to tell from this particular time. If you buy me a drink in the bar later, I'll tell you all about this phenomenon called cabin hopping. 
So we went through and we looked at the website as it was. We looked at the order that people went through in, and then we looked at what information people wanted as they went through. We then drew this spaghetti diagram. And what the spaghetti diagram helped us do was show what a mess their existing digital design was. Remember that second third that I mentioned about um, making decision, uh, getting the business to, to make a decision? I showed that their digital stuff was a complete mess. This diagram was called the spaghetti diagram and it unlocked all of the money for us to go and fix and design a brand new website. We designed a brand new website for them, very simple. User flow through the site in the order that people expect the steps to go in based on the mental model, fantastic. We base this around the idea of slow thinking, okay? Making decisions bit by bit based on previous knowledge, limiting decisions and helping people make decisions. So my first tip for designing from the fast and slow is to understand what people want, the order they want it in, and design to match that mental model. If you're doing this, you're gonna be in a great place because you're understanding what people want and you're giving it to them at the point when it's needed and you're helping them make decisions by giving them the right information at the right time. That's the slow. Let's talk about the fast. Again, a study published in the year 2000. Again, ATMs. I've got a bit of an obsession with ATMs. This was a study about two designs of ATM, one of which was designed with graphics, one of which was just plain text on a plain background. Exactly the same interaction, the same steps that people went through. What happened? Which one, when they asked people, which one did you prefer using? Which one did you find the easiest to use? Was it the plain one or was it the designed one? It was the designed one. The designed one was always shown for people felt it was easier. It even took them slightly longer to complete the tasks, but they preferred it. The preference was there. When we're thinking quickly, beautiful things are more appealing, rather like Petter's card trick, choosing the most attractive people. We choose more attractive things over something else. It's worth spending time in the design. So what did this beautiful design look like? I hear you're asking. What is this beauty, beautiful epoch of digital design on ATMs? Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. There is the perfect ATM design. It's in Hebrew. They put a massive graphic on the left-hand side. But even so, this thing that we're all thinking, this is really ugly, was really important because it felt more easy to use than plain text. It's worth investing time and effort in design. It's a client I work with called Ritz-Carlton. A lot of time and effort in design because design helps make decision choices. Identical booking process on Marriott.com because they own Ritz Carlton to Ritz Carlton. People make better decisions with more ev evocative imagery. People make more choices, they convert better on Ritz Carlton versus Marriott. Exactly the same process, but the more beautiful imagery helps support people get through it. So beauty evokes emotion, and emotion, incredibly important in the human brain, is a fantastic way of supporting the fast system. So we talked about the slow system, match the mental model. The fast system is to evoke emotion. If you're evoking emotion and making people feel good about doing what you're doing by creating beautiful imagery, fantastic fonts and design, that emotion will make people feel better about using your service. Even if it's not the most perfect thing out there, it will help them understand and support what's going on. You've got to do both of these things. If you do both of these things, you're gonna be in a fantastic place, says psychology, to improve your design. And the third I'm going to talk about is this kind of grey area of instinct. And I'm also going to talk about um, digital design as part of this as well. Final ATM story. Anybody know this movie? Yeah, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. This came out when I was 15. And what happens in this movie is Edward Connor breaks into ATMs by trying to hack them. He subtly tries to get into an ATM by trying to hack it. So when I was at school, some kids at school, we spotted this particular thing. And these kids, I went to a pretty, pretty bad school. These kids... Uh, not the best parents, somehow got some money together to buy the identical computer here, which is the Atari, um, little Atari handheld. They bought me one of these because they knew I was good at computers. And we went out and we tried to hack cash machines. If my mother's watching this, please don't tell my mother. Sorry, mum, I know this is being live streamed. I did put it on Facebook, so if you're watching this, sorry, mum. I got involved in a bit of crime. Did it work? Did it hell? No way. We tried to hack so many crime machines, and in the end we just got chased away and I lost my nerve. The gang I worked with after we left school, they went on and they were incredibly successful at crime, especially relating to ATMs. Do you want to know how they did it? This is how they did it. They stole a JCB, like a, lo a local tractor. They went in, they took the whole ATM and they went away. This taught me an important lesson. Subtlety doesn't work. <laughs> if you want to get stuff done, this is the way that you get stuff done. Learn a little bit from crime there. Who says crime doesn't pay? It taught me an important lesson.
And the same is true of digital design. We try this subtle crap. We try images of happy people because, oh, yeah, happy people are going to make people buy stuff from us. This stuff, absolute crap. Okay? Stock imagery of happy looking people doesn't work. Mental models work. Beautiful imagery works. This crap doesn't work. Okay? This junk, how to use 10 psychology theories to persuade people, absolute bull crap. If you're resorting to this stuff, something's very wrong with your mental model. Something's very wrong with the beauty of your product, your design. You get the mental model and the beauty right, you don't have to go to these depths of doing this really awful persuasive nudge bullshit that's out there these days. And people have built their careers on this crap. You don't need to go to these lengths. All you need to do is not eye tracking, not neural linguistic programming, nothing like that. Don't bother. And so how did it work for me? The cruise site that I worked on, the first transaction in the first week, £43,000. Somebody booked a cruise for £43,000 in the first week that I did it. Now, in the US of A, I did this presentation. People clapped at that number. So I'm quite pleased that us Europeans, no, no, don't be vulgar. We're not going to do it. He's going to pull me off the stage now. So my final three tips. Match the mental model, evoke emotion, just do those things and you'll be absolutely fine, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry. Let's take, let's take.